Welcome to Must See Films. My name's Darren, and this channel is helping you see films differently. One of my favorite things about offering these videos to the film community is there seems to be a real appetite for the discussion of great films. With this in mind, I want to bring a film to the table that hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. And my two main aims with this video are to raise some awareness of the quality and the uniqueness of this film. And secondly, explore the structural form, themes and narrative of Kubrick's forgotten masterpiece. <laughs> Um, it's hard. It's hard to choose one of, right. of the pictures. I, I have um, uh, very strong feelings about Barry Lyndon and about 2001. Now, is the film's lack of awareness due to a drop in quality from Kubrick, as even the best of directors have flops in their body of work? Measuring quality in a subjective medium can be very difficult, but box office money and critical review are one way of gauging a film's success. However, the test of a work of art in the end is our affection for it, not our ability to explain why it is good. Now, Barry Lyndon has found its way into my heart and I am confident that people will be moved with a little openness and some encouragement. So why then has the film created such a barrier? It's hardly surprising since the film is rarely discussed online. The DVD is out of production in major stores, it's not included in some of Kubrick's box sets, and isn't as iconic at first glance as something like The Shining or 2001. The film is also a three hour period piece that deliberately uses a slow pace of storytelling. Even if some people watch the film once, the film's weight doesn't invite multiple viewings. Now the reason The Shining has received so much attention and analysis in recent years is due to the examination and investigation of the complexity of the film, requiring multiple viewings and taking over a 30 year period since the film's release. The same level of complexity and craft are present in Barry Lyndon, but its non-user friendly genre and length and pace have slowed down the interest and rewatch factor for the film. And all those films are so filled with hairpin turns and story surprises and character surprises that you must see his films more than once because you yearn for those same surprises. And the genius of Stanley is you can look at a movie of his 15 times and even though you know it's right around the corner, you'll still give up, give it up, and you'll be, you'll be surprised all over again. And I don't know anybody else who possesses that kind of magic. Here's my three reasons why you should give Barry Lyndon a chance. The cold director. Kubrick has been described as a cold and distant director. However, Barry Lyndon is an extremely moving character study about human beings, their ambitions, their flaws and regrets, and the slow nature of the film that some view as a flaw becomes trance-like after its opening moments. Perhaps the best looking film ever made. Kubrick went to extreme lengths, as he did with every film, to break technical ground, but for the purpose of elevating the story through the visuals. Every image in Barry Lyndon is gorgeous and so well crafted. And Stanley sent me this lens and said, could I mount it on his BNC camera? I said, Stanley, it's absolutely impossible. Uh, we would have to damn near wreck your camera and make it purely dedicated to do this. And he said, fine, go ahead and do it. It uh, originally was a lens manufactured, designed, developed, and manufactured by Zeiss uh, for NASA. And of course, NASA was planned to use it in satellite uh, photography. And for that reason, it's an extremely fast lens. It's an F0.7, which is two stops faster than the fastest lenses that are available even today. Of course, Stanley's intention for these lenses was to shoot the famous candlelit scenes in Barry Lyndon. When you look at all of his films, even though they all have one thing in common, for me anyway, the craft is impeccable. Every film he's ever made, the craft is impeccable. 
the lighting, the dolly shots, the crane moves, the zoom-ins on Barry Lyndon, the framing, the lighting, the hot windows as backlight. You know, you know, there's the compositions. I mean, the exact compositions. You had to hit your mark precisely to please Stanley so he'd get his painting, the painting he was putting on canvas for you to appreciate it. It had to be perfect. Uh, the, the, his choice of lenses, his steady cam work in, 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 in latter year films, impeccable, the best in history. Nobody could shoot a movie better than Stanley Kubrick in history. As part of this movement to bring Barry Lyndon back to popularity, I'm sure it will be a topic of discussion during the Oscar season with The Revenant, a film ambitious enough to use no artificial lighting, shooting the film entirely with natural light to give the feel of authenticity in the 1820s, a feat that Kubrick pioneered 40 years earlier with Barry Lyndon. The Kubrick Touch. Despite the subject matter of 18th century period piece, the film undoubtedly has the Kubrick Touch and presence the entire way through. His very distinct voice, which has been made famous in other films, is very evident and sharp here. The film by mere association is grouped together with other films of its genre and time period, but the film stylistically and formally fits with Kubrick's body of work. To fully appreciate the strength of each element within the film, it's important to have context to see how these things fit in. Much like Full Metal Jacket, Barry Lyndon is a film of two halves. The rise and the fall of a young opportunist. The film cleverly uses each half to emphasize repetition of actions, symmetry of events and contrasting moments to heighten some of the emotional beats. The father and son theme throughout the film was a driving force for Barry's actions, and we'll see how his young rebellious nature causes both his rise and ironically his fall. Barry's father is killed in the opening moments of the film in a duel, a confrontation that will be revisited by Barry later in the film. Now, Despite his father's death screen time, the significance of the event is crucial, as all Barry's actions throughout the film suggest a craving for surrogate father figures, and a need to follow in his many father's footsteps. This progression of different role models gives Barry the appearance of a social climber, however his drive is more fueled by a deep need for fatherhood and a place of pain rather than ambition. Barry can't stand Captain Quinn taking his young love with his military status, but Barry later uses his false military status as a captain and seduces a young woman, living out the fantasy once displayed by Quinn. There are other clues and similarities that suggest Barry is living out the fantasy he observed. Both women look similar, both are impressed by captain status of the men, both scenes have the presence of thunder in the background, I'm an officer and I must do my duty. A baby of sorts. And both men tip their hats as they head off into their next adventure. Notice how Barry follows the pattern of observing and then emulating throughout. Barry looks up to and respects Captain Grogan, who refers to Barry as my boy. Now look here, Redmond, my boy. Barry later joins the army himself in his next father's footsteps. Captain Potsdor first catches Barry for impersonating, something that he'll do again. Potsdor becomes fond of Barry and takes him under his wing. Barry later works for Potsdorf and plays out the role of the favourite son. Sent to spy on the Chevalier, Barry cracks when hearing the old Irish tongue and soon becomes the Chevalier's right-hand man, not to mention impersonating him. Don't look so downcast, my boy. Redmond, my boy. Take a seat. The first half concludes with Barry's rise by continuing his rebellious nature and forcing his way into an upper class family, with aims of replacing a father figure despite resentment and instant hatred from Bullington, the stepson. He seems to me little more than a common opportunist. I don't think he loves my mother at all. And it hurts me very much to see her make such a fool of herself. <laughs> 